Today, we're meeting with a special guest from our museum. The Natural History Museum is home to over 35 million objects and specimens, and these collections are used to conduct research, put on display in exhibitions, or play a part in programs we develop. Each staff member has a special area of focus for their work, but together they are helping to build and share the history of life on our planet. In just a moment, we're going to hear from Dr. Jan Vendetti, Associate Cur Curator of Malacology. Malacology is the study of mollusks. This includes snails and slugs, which we'll hear about today. Dr. Vendetti's research is focused in the natural history, evolution, systematics, and conservation of marine and terrestrial snails, an extremely diverse group of organisms. Jan joined the museum in 2014 and has focused on collections-based research and the snails and slugs living in metropolitan environments, or SLIME project, championing the important role of community science to understanding urban biodiversity. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can meet our presenter today. And you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Dr. Vandetti. Hi, thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Um, as Jessica said, my name is Jan Vendetti. I'm the Associate Curator in Malacology. And if you were visiting the museum um, and you had a behind the scenes tour, which is hard to get, you would see um, this sign or this, uh, this label on my door. So this is my Malacology office door um, in the part of the museum that's not open for exhibits, but the part of the museum where our collections are held and where our curators work. So I'm one of those people. So my job is to study mollusks um, that we have in collections and also build our collections, like Jessica was saying, to include more diversity of, um, of life on earth. And for my job, that's just mollusks, which is a really big group. So I'm gonna start showing myself. This is me a very long time ago. I think I was around six, five or six. Um, this is at my home in New Jersey where I grew up. Um, and this is a hamster. Um, and so I had as a child, um, uh, a very deep interest in animals and, um, and enjoyed having a hamster as a pet as well as a dog. But I did not go on to study mammals, right? Hamsters and dogs are mammals. Um, but I didn't go on to study them because I also had um, a pretty remarkable experience. Um, every summer I would uh, go to Maine, the coast of Maine to visit family. And, um, and I had a chance to explore the tide pools. And we have some of the best tide pools in the entire world in, on the coast of California, but I didn't grow up in California. So, um, so I grew up in, anyway, I grew up on the East Coast and I would, I would spend some of my summertime um, exploring tide pools in, um, marine tide pools in Maine. And that was where my love for invertebrates, so um, things without backbones, so snails and slugs and crabs and um, all sorts of other, uh, other non-vertebrate uh, animals that are the most common species that you find um, in tide pools. And if you're looking carefully at this photo, you can see all of these little gray sort of dots here are periwinkles. Um, so those are uh, snails called litterina that are really, really common in tide pools along the East Coast. We have them here on the West Coast too. So I ended up studying mollusks. Um, I went to college and I thought I might be a veterinarian, which a lot of people who, um, who are interested in animals as a kid um, have that interest. But the more I studied invertebrates and the more I studied the biodiversity or got interested in the biodiversity of life, the more I realized that I wanted to study these other groups, um, including mollusks. So when I went to college, um, I studied paleontology. So the history of life as also, um, also extant or living biodiversity of invertebrates. I studied both of those things. And then I went on to graduate school um, and then I ended up at the museum. And because my uh, research history was in mollusks all the way. So I worked when I got my PhD, which is what, why there's doctor in front of my name and, and PhD after it. Um, that very long degree, while I was studying for that and working on that, I was studying snails. And then I moved to Los Angeles and I studied sea slugs, which are also mollusks. So I became a malacologist, which is a person who studies mollusks. 
Okay, so this image here is showing you um, a depiction of like one or two representatives from these different big groups of olive mollusks. Mollusks are, there are lots and lots of species, more than almost any group of organisms on earth which is probably a surprise to most of you. The, mo the group with the most species on earth are the arthropods, and that includes insects. And there's more insects than every of any other group of, of organisms on earth, any other group of animals on earth. But mollusks come in second. So there's, there are many, many species. In fact, there are about 100,000 species. And we have a large representation of that diversity, biodiversity in our collections in our Los Angeles um, uh, County Museum of Natural History. So this is just an image of North American seashells. So if you're one, one way of, of sort of um, thinking and, and connecting to the topic of malacology is through, is through seashells. <clears throat> if ever you're at a beach, you'll find um, remnants of mollusks. You'll find seashells from mollusks. Um, and if you know somebody who has a seashell collection, which a lot of people do, then they're collecting seashells sometimes um, from around the world. And sometimes people trade each other for seashells because it can be like a really intense, interesting collection um, for people to have. Okay, so I'm just gonna remind you again, there's about 100,000 species of all of mollusks. To put that into perspective, because sometimes it's hard to know, well, what does that mean compared to some other group? Um, up here, this is a chicken and a crow. They're representing all of birds. In birds, there are about 15,000 species. So think of every bird species you can think of. So all the ones we have in California, all the ones that um, throughout the entire world, there are about 15,000 species. And for mammals, that's what this um, uh, wolf and elephant are representing. For mammals, there are about 10,000. So 10,000 species, there's 10 times as many mollusks as there are mammals. So every mammal that you can think of from a mouse to an elephant, there's 10 times that many mollusks. So it's a really big group, really, really big group. The most, um, the most familiar of the mollusks are probably the gastropods. This is the, the scientific name that we give to snails and sea slugs. So the, these are highlighted or circled in yellow. These are sea slugs here and then shelled gastropods here. Bivalves, if, you, if you've ever eaten a mollusk, my guess is that you've probably eaten a bivalve. So clams, mussels, oysters, um, there's a bunch of different groups um, called like cockles um, and, and some others, but this is a, a pretty common, um, very common group of, of mollusks that we see in fish markets and the supermarket. Um, they're freshwater and um, ocean living, the bivalves. Chitons, we don't eat, or at least in North America, we, we don't typically eat them. They're, a, um, they're an eight plated, they sort of look like a roly poly, but they live only um, on rocks in the ocean and they, they stick themselves or adhere themselves really tightly to rocks. So sometimes if you go to a tide pool in California or other places around the world, you'll see them and there's sometimes like a mystery, what is this creature? And it's a mollusk and it moves, but very, very slowly. Um, and then the cephalopods, which um, are often malacologists and other people's favorite mollusks because they have sometimes big eyes and they move fast. So these are our friends. This is the, the chambered nautilus here, um, squid uh, and cuttlefish and then octopus. So they're all the family members of the mollusca or the mollusks. So I'm just gonna show you some pictures, marine, and, and give you some numbers, marine snails. So these are the gastropods that live in the ocean. There are about 40,000 species. And this is, a, this is one friend that lives in um, Southern California oceans. This is Caledia caledii with um, uh, an orange and black and white spotted body. This is the biggest, it's called a sea hare. It's the biggest sea slug in the world. And it lives on our, our Southern California coast. And this is um, a child holding a sea, this sea slug. They can be like, if you're looking at a picture, if you're looking at me, they are about this big. They're like, they can be as big as a loaf of bread. Um, the biggest in the whole world lives on our coast. Terrestrial mollusks, there are also about 40,000 species. These are snails that live on land. So they don't live in the ocean at, at all. And we have, as it turns out, quite a diversity of land snails in Los Angeles County and throughout 
California, the whole state of California. And our land snails are really good at blending in with their environment. So they usually have this brown color and the ones that are native or indigenous, that means they evolved here in California and are not from somewhere else. They have a brown band, which you can just barely see in this photo and they're called shoulder band snails. This, sna this slug we don't have in California. This is from Australia. And I'm showing this picture because it's so amazing. And this species was, um, was discovered and described not that long ago. Um, just to show you that slugs are also snails and ga uh, are gastropods. And there is a lot to be discovered in this group, in, in um, terrestrial, so land living and also ocean living gastropods. There's still a lot of species that are undescribed by scientists. So at the museum, if I were giving you a tour around our collections, we have our collections organized by, by um, what's called taxonomy. So what is their species? We don't have them organized by where we found them. We have them organized by the species that they are. So that's their type. What type are they? These are uh, gastropods from Alaska, from our um, what's called the Eastern Pacific. So our uh, Western North American coast. Um, this is what our collection room looks like. So we have multiple rooms with, uh, with our collections in them. So you can see that it doesn't look like an exhibit, right? Because it's not supposed to. It's supposed to be a clean and, um, uh, and good place for these collections to be well protected from heat and water uh, and that they're organized well. So it's supposed to look like a very well organized closet, basically and all of these metal cabinets, um, this is in which these, these cabinets hold drawers of our specimens. So this is one drawer. These are wet specimens. So our specimens, if, an, if there's a slug, for example, we can't dry out that slug or we don't, we put that slug in a preservative called ethanol. So we put it in a kind of alcohol that keeps it from decomposing. So someone can get DNA out of it and also um, study parts of its body. Here are some of our oysters. Here are some of our wet collections. These are snails and slugs from Southern California, which if, you, if you've seen any snails and slugs from Southern California, you might um, recognize some of these. And they look a little funny because they're in that preservative liquid. They're in this liquid that keeps them from decomposing so that the animal inside we can study if we need to or want to, or other scientists can. That's part of the reason we have collections. These are chitons. So I want to show you a picture of chitons. Um, these are from New Zealand. So they're these eight plated roly-poly like looking things, but they're mollusks from the, um, uh, from the coast of around the world. This is an octopus that was collected in 1969. So we have um, a lot of specimens that were collected a long time ago, which is really important for scientists around the world, understanding how extinction, when and how extinction happens and how biodiversity in particular places changes. So if you wanted to know what, how many snails and slugs or octopuses or anything I could find in say California um, uh, 50 years ago, how would you do that? As a scientist, you would use museum collections. You would go back to collections and ask the curator and collections manager to find you those specimens. And then you would know what animals were there at that time. Um, this is an octopus, a special octopus's egg case, which I could talk more about at the end if anyone has questions. Um, and then just a little bit of, about biodiversity. So when I talk about biodiversity collections and that we're interested in studying biodiversity, there's a lot of biodiversity in mollusks. What I mean is that um, there are, biodiversity means the variety of, variety of species in an environment or within like a, a group of organisms. So how many species do you have? This is a sea slug called Thuridilla picta, which means, picta means it has been painted. It hasn't, it just looks like it. Like it naturally looks these amazing colors. It's a tiny sea slug that's probably about like the size, maybe twice the size of the eraser on your, on your pencil. It's very small. So if we had low biodiversity, although these are this is a beautiful, beautiful species, if we had all the same species in an environment, that might be a good sign for this species because it seems like it's doing very well, but it also means that it has low biodiversity. If we had high biodiversity, that would mean that there were many different species living in that same place. So that's what biodiversity means. You can have high or low. Generally, when we say there is biodiversity, it means high biodiversity. 
And then who studies it? So this is a, so, someone like me um, or someone like you and what characteristics it takes to become someone who studies biodiversity or any science in general is someone who is curious. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the absolute best student in the class in every subject. It means you just care about that subject and are interested in it. Um, you also have to have, like I said, an interest. So an interest in fossil or living things. There's fossil extinct biodiversity as well as living biodiversity. So this is showing um, pictures, artists' depictions of extinct cephalopods, so extinct relatives of octopus and squid that lived in the ocean millions, um, hundreds of millions of years ago. These are called ammonites. And we have an excellent collection of these at the museum as well in our fossil collections. Um, enjoy exploration. It could be exploration of the natural world or exploration of the fossil world by collecting fossils. It could be exploration in the collections, um, just wanting to know more and wanting to learn more and always being open to learning. Um, it could be exploring your natural, the natural environment around us. So that could be studying species that live in Los Angeles and Southern California. And then also depending on the situation that you're in, it could also be enjoying exploration through books. So through books from the library or books at home or books from school, um, any books that describe um, species from elsewhere in the world, like guidebooks are a good way to look at biodiversity from around the world. Um, and then I'm just gonna show you a couple pictures um, before I wrap up of, of various specimens that we have in collections. So these are pictures of, of different um, mollusk species with their names. And I just wanna remind you that a scientific name has a genus, that's the first name, and a species, that's the second. And the species is usually in Latin. And if some of you are Spanish speakers, you might be much better at this than I am because there are a lot of Latin roots that are shared between Latin and Spanish. And um, so for example, in Tony, uh, Tona Gallia, it means Tona, the helmet, because this shell is so big that it looks like a helmet. Here's another one, this is called Voluta Musica, and it's called Musica, even if you don't know Latin or Spanish, you can tell what Musica means. It looks like there's musical notation on this shell. So the person who described it named it Musica for the characteristics of its shell, which is I think a really beautiful name. Lambus millipeda, you might know what that means. Millipeda means many legs, like a millipede has many legs. And this, these are not legs of this shell, they're extensions, really remarkable extensions of this shell. And the, but the name is many legs because it looks like it has many legs. Then my very favorite gastropod of all, Janthina Janthina, which is name is the same name twice. And Janthina means purple. And um, it's because it's a purple shell. And it also does this amazing thing where it makes a bubble raft and it, it lives upside down floating on the ocean water with its bubble raft and it eats um, uh, um, other animals that it comes across uh, that are floating. So uh, like jellyfish, it'll eat those jellyfish, but it'll stay on the top of the water floating along on its, um, on its raft of bubbles. And so there's its, but, and upside down, so there's its mouth and its foot and its bubbles. That's my very, very favorite gastropod. Um, and with that, I am, I'm gonna stop sharing and I would be very happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Dr. Vendetti. We've got some good questions here. Let's jump right in. So, uh, Caitlin is wondering, what would be the impact on the world if mollusks didn't exist? Oh, wow. That's a good question. So uh, really quickly, um, a lot of land snails are decomposers. So if, you, if you've learned anything about like ecology and um, the sort of web of life and um, the different roles that organisms play in an environment, a lot of gastropods, a lot of land snails are decomposers. So they eat up dead things and they recycle them back into, into the soil. So if you didn't have those gastropods, those snails decomposing things, there would be a lot less um, nutrients in the soil for other organisms. Um, also, there are uh, sea slugs and other mollusks that are used for um, pharmaceutical discovery. So there are chemicals that certain sea slugs and snails in the ocean particularly will make that are studied as possible, the possible basis for therapeutic drugs. So like drugs for um, cancer and pain relief and things like that, because there are scientists, biochemists who look for certain um, natural compounds 
that then they can synthesize and make in a lab that are useful for, um, for human, uh, human health. So, and that's two. And then also, I think just, um, just to have lost a lot of biodiversity would be, would be a sad thing and would impact environments all um, and, and food webs throughout the world. Um, mollusks have been around for over 500 million years and to lose them, if you think about it, they're in almost every environment. So it would be a, a huge loss for world biodiversity and ecology. Thank you. Sure. Um, that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, what country has the most mollusk species? Country, which country has the most mollusks? That's a very good question. Often the tropics, um, places in the tropics have um, a lot of mollusk species. And I can't say this for sure, but if I had to make, if I had to say one place that has the most marine mollusks and terrestrial mollusks, it would be the Philippines. Cool, so we've got a ton of questions, so I'm gonna to try to get to as many as possible. Um, Konomi is wondering, what is your favorite thing about being a scientist? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, I think because uh, the, probably my favorite thing is that I get to be curious all the time. I get to think about answering, asking and answering questions all the time as part of my job. And I have the ability as um, a curator at the museum to study almost anything I want in the collections. So I could walk into the collections, open a drawer and find something, some, some mollusk species for which there are unanswered research questions. And that's for most species of mollusks. So much is yet to be learned. So I have the freedom to study almost anything I want. That's the absolute best part of my job. That's awesome. Um, so let's see, um, Haley is wondering how long does it take to become a scientist? Depends on what scientist, what kind of scientist you wanna be. The more, um, the more specialized you become, the more training it takes. So you can become a scientist after college and do certain kinds of science. So that's four years, typically four years of college. But if you wanted to have a more, um, uh, a more specific job with more responsibilities, you would probably have to get a master's degree, which is two more years after college. And then if you wanted a PhD degree, like my degree, which is pretty much the highest you can go, it, it would take after college five or six years after college to, to learn enough to be a PhD. So from just to college to five or six years after college, depending on what you wanted to do. Thank you. Sure. Um, Henry is wondering, what is the most common mollusk in California? Common, oh, that's a tough one. There are some introduced species that are extremely common. I'm not sure that this is, if, if let's, say, let's say on land in California. In Southern California, the species that might be the most numerous is called the, um, the white Italian snail. And it's not, that, that name probably gives it away. It's not from California, it's from, the, um, North Africa and, and uh, the Mediterranean. That's why it's called Italian, Italian snail. And it was introduced to Southern California um, for food and otherwise maybe accidentally. And there are places in Southern California in particular in San Diego where there are like thousands of snails that will cover a single tree. So they are what's called highly invasive. They're, they, they end up reproducing a lot. And in, in some places you could have hundreds of thousands of those snails, like in a very small area. So I might, I might guess, I would make an educated guess that in certain parts of California, that would be the most common. It's not necessarily good for the environment though. So yeah, not a good situation. Um, Jeanette is wondering, how does the Janthina Janthina create its bubble raft? Such a good question. So most questions about mollusks, the answer is nobody knows because well, no one has, has done that research. There are so many species and there's so much biodiversity and so many parts of their, of their life, like we call that life history, that no one knows anything about. Sometimes they're also hard to find. So what we know is that they, they make, um, they, they, with their foot, so normally a snail would be sliming along, right, crawling along, and it has sticky slime on its foot. Now this snail is upside down and it has sticky slime on its foot and it's somehow blowing air through that slime and making slime bubbles. And they're not, but it's not just like, like a slime bubble that would easily pop. They mix in, they have the ability to add a chemical 
um, into their slime that makes those bubbles last for a few days. So it makes the bubbles much harder to pop. So somehow they add air to through the slime of their foot. How they do it, I don't know. But they have to do it over and over and over to keep that, that bubble raft, um, enough bubbles to keep them floating. But they don't pop immediately like if you were to blow bubbles, right? Like soap bubbles and pop them. It would be like much more resistant than that. Super cool adaptation. Yeah. <laughs> um, on that note, Henry is wondering uh, what mollusk has the coolest feature? Oh, um, there are probably a lot. I think that that Janthina have, um, snail, the purple snail having a bubble raft is a cool feature, but there's another group of snails called cone snails and they have a feeding structure. Most, most snails have a feeding structure that looks like, it's sort of like, um, it's kind of like a cat tongue, like a like sandpapery, sandpapery ribbon in their mouth that they use to eat. But in this group called cone snails, their, um, their mouth, their, this, it's called a radula. This particular structure has evolved to become like a spear. And when they want to eat something, instead of rasping at it or like grating at it, like they would a plant, this group of, of snails has evolved to eat um, worms and other snails and fish. And they will crawl up to what their, their prey and then shoot this little spear at it and then pull it in and eat it. And they're, and they're, when they shoot their radular spear, their mouth spear into that and kill it, it's not that they kill it by spearing it. They have um, real, they've evolved really uh, potent chemicals that are toxic to that animal that, um, that kill them. And those, some of those cone snails are being used for medicine discovery because there are those chemicals that they make are unique and important to people who are studying the development of hum of medicines for humans. That's a cool, cool adaptation too. Whole other world. <laughs> um, okay, we, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Caitlin is wondering what the newest species of mollusks um, that was discovered. What is oh, it? Oh gosh, the newest. Um, every year there's probably about 50 maybe 25 to 50, depending on the year, new species of mollusks discovered. Most of them are, are snails and slugs. Um, and often they're species that look a lot like species that are already known, but using DNA, we can tell that they're different. But the name of the most recent one, I mean, I would have to look, I don't know, but there was probably a species discovered and, and published in the last week. Yeah, but I don't know what it's called. I could, I could look and, and report back. Thank you. And we'll wrap up with a question from Camilla. She is wondering, what was the first mollusk species you discovered? There was a Caribbean species. Um, I, let's see, I think its name is, yes, Alicia Zemi, Z-E-M-I. And it's named after the indigenous people of a part of the Caribbean. And it's a sea slug, a really beautiful um, sea slug that was found in collections. So it was in natural history collections and we looked at its DNA and determined, a colleague of mine and myself, and discovered that it was a new species. Very cool. Well, thank you, Dr. Vendetti. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you students and friends for joining us. Uh, we learned so much about malacology and about Dr. Vendetti's work. Let me Thanks, just everybody. wrap up our program. Thank you. So if you want to see more from the Natural History Museum, you can uh, you can give us a follow on Instagram at NHMLA. We'll also have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can watch this recording and others at youtube.com slash NHMLA. Thank you for joining us. We'll have another amazing special guest, Leela Higgins, our Senior Community Science Manager, next Thursday morning. We hope to see you then. Bye, everyone.